As council president, I now uh, call the uh, city council work session for April 12th at 7 p.m. Uh, would uh, Councilman Peterson please lead us in the pledge? And Councilman Larson, would you uh, do the invocation? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Our eternal Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the opportunity to be here and serve on the council to help and to make life better in our city of Riverton. Father, we are thankful for the, we the weather, we're thankful for the opportunity to serve, we're thankful for the support which we receive from the city. Please bless us that we might be mindful, be able to adequately review and discuss the budget. Bless us with insight and understanding. Bless us and Riverton. Thank you, Father. I say this humbly, name thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The city clerk, please conduct the roll call. Yes, Your Honor. Councilman Mike Bailey. Here. Councilman Martin Canan. Here. Councilman Kyle Larson. Here. Councilman Sean Peterson. Here. Council President and Acting Mayor Lee Martinez. Here. So we do have a quorum. <laughs> I declare that we have a quorum. Uh, the, council, uh, the chair would entertain a motion to excuse Mayor John Wells Baker from the tonight's meeting. Motion to excuse uh, Mayor Baker. Second. It's been moved and seconded to excuse the Mayor John Baker. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Motion passed. Your Honor, we have one. Yeah, that's all you. Were you okay there? One, two, three, four, five, six. You're pretty much close, Kyle. <laughs> Probably Gibbons says that. Uh, Your Honor, she's she's running late from soccer this afternoon. So she will be here then? Okay, good. I declare that we have a quorum. Uh, uh, the chair would entertain a motion to approve the agenda with one addition. We'll, we will call 5A, and that's the Children's Advocacy Group from Casper here to make a presentation, Ms. Heather Ross. So I entertain a motion to uh, add that to the quorum, to the agenda, I'm sorry. Your Honor, I would move that we accept the agenda as amended. Seconded. It's been moved and seconded to uh, accept the uh, agenda as amended. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Now I need to uh, entertain a motion to uh, approve the agenda with the amendment. Motion to approve the agenda and the amendment. It's been moved and seconded to approve the agenda as amended. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Motion passed. Okay, you're up. today I drove up from Casper and um, luckily the roads were completely amazing so I was very lucky um, to come on such a lovely night um, my name's Heather Ross I'm the executive director of the Children's Advocacy Project some of you guys might recall that I've come in the past to um, request funds from the city of Riverton before um, what our program does we're actually located in Casper Wyoming um, but for anyone who's new we provide, provide a service for your law enforcement investigators, your Department of Family First Services investigators, as well as your um, county attorney when they're investigating victims of crime, specifically those victims being children under the age of 18. The majority of our cases are um, alleged victims of child sexual assault, 
but we also work with children who have been victims um, or witnessed domestic violence, um, kidnapping, homicide, uh, and other activities like that. So um, we've been providing services in Casper since about 2002. We've actively served Fremont County during those years. Within the last few years, we were able to open up a center located right here in Riverton. We had that center up and running for two years while we tried to establish uh, full-time funding so that way we could establish a center and keep it running. Unfortunately, um, the state of Wyoming had other choices with their funding, and we were not uh, granted additional funds to keep that program up and running. So we had to shut down the Riverton Center, but we're still pleased to be able to offer those services in Casper. Um, one of the reasons I come to you guys today is I make this trek across the state of Wyoming to ask for funds from various city and county uh, municipalities to keep our program open and running. I'm not sure how many of you guys received our annual summer report, but if you have a copy of this, you'll notice that there's a map of the state of Wyoming. And on the map, you'll see the number of services that we provided for each county. Does anyone need a copy? No? So you'll see that there's a map for each of the counties. Um, last year, we provided 323 forensic interviews to children who were alleged victims of child abuse. 40 of those cases came directly from Fremont County. So a pretty significant portion of the um, cases that we conducted, in fact, 12% came from Fremont County. Out of Fremont County, the majority of those cases came from the Riverton Police Department and the Riverton Department of Family Services. Um, the forensic interview is um, really kind of a unique service. Uh, we're only one of three programs across the entire state that conduct forensic interviews. There is a program in Jackson, one in Cheyenne, and ours in Casper. As you can see from the map, we serve about two-thirds of the state of Wyoming. Um, to be able to provide that service, we do not charge uh, anyone for the service that we're providing. Instead, we ask for some support from municipalities to be able to keep those services up and running. Um, the amount of funds that we've received from the city of Riverton in the past was $4,500. We're asking for that continued funding. Um, this is not different from any of the other counties that we serve. Uh, in fact, many of the counties, we request a total of $6,000. Um, so it's very in line. As you can see on the funding request that although we provided 12% of our interviews um, for Fremont County, we're only asking for about 0.9% of our overall budget. Um, 4,500, uh, whether it sounds like a lot or a little, uh, it ends up being a lot when it comes to our operating budget. Many of our funds come from local um, city and county funds when they're interjected into the entire budget, whether it's Carbon County or Bighorn County, um, Washakie County, Converse County, Platte County, they all go into a fund to help provide the services that we offer, mainly um, being able to um, hire our forensic interviewers to be able to conduct that service. So that's us in a nutshell. I appreciate um, the chief being here today. Um, we, like I said, we were really sad that we had to um, close down the Riverton Center, but we truly believe that we're still being able to um, conduct business in a um, efficient and feasible manner for all of Fremont County and being able to give the best services possible for your child victims. Do you have any questions I might be able to answer? Anybody have any questions? Mr. Bailey. Um, your Honor, I guess a couple of questions. Um, I assume that since you don't have a center here anymore that you just travel here to do the interviews as needed? Thank you for asking the question, Councilman Bailey. Actually, what we do is um, the child drives to Casper. Um, they're um, usually brought with a parent who is um, providing the transportation, and then law enforcement and Department of Family Services also come to Casper to watch the interview as it happens. It's really important that the um, investigators are right there as it's happening. The interview is conducted in a small interview room with just two chairs. It's a member of our staff, a forensic interviewer, and the child, but it's fed into a um, live feed 
through um, a TV into the other room where the actual Riverton Police Department investigator and Department of Family Services would be watching that interview. So in the past, when we had the Riverton Center, that was the ultimate goal, is that we would be able to provide that service here. Unfortunately, um, due to lack of funds, we were just unable to continue to support that. We ran that program for a little over two years before we had to shut it down. And then my other question would be, do you also go ask for funds from Lander and Fremont County, or Definitely. are we the only one in the county? Yes, sir. No, we go and ask for um, funds from um, the Fremont County commissioners who have been very generous in the past. We hope that generosity will continue. I believe last year they provided um, $8,000 in funds. Um, I'm sure you guys are all well aware of your neighboring cohort, um, City of Lander, whose funds are um, being really um, used to supplement a uh, community center. And so they have not um, been able to uh, make the choice to fund us in the past. So we've received zero dollars from the city of Lander in the last three years. So is that a list we could get of who is contributing how much? Yes, sir, definitely. Yeah, I missed that. Yes, it should be listed in the budget. Mm -hmm. All right, I apologize. That's okay. Thank you for pointing that out. Council McCann? Yeah. Um, you, how many, you, I guess I'm looking at this le the cover letter that I got. Yes. You said how many interviews were done in Fremont County? Fremont County last year, um, con we conducted 40 forensic interviews. This says 15, and then it's, it says for, in, for Riverton you did seven. I'm with sorry, your sir. your cover letter. Oh, I'm not sure well, why that is. I, I'm sorry about that, um, Councilman Command. On this, um, uh, here you'll see that the actual forensic interviews conducted were 40. I apologize for any um, typo or error that was done on the letter itself. Okay. And of your personnel, you, it says here that you have, uh, I guess, looking for six and 17. How many of those are interviewers? Uh, three are forensic interviewers and um, counselors combined positions. So only three. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other positions, myself as the executive director, we have uh, one position that is an office manager. So currently we have five total positions. Uh, next year we're looking at increasing that to six total positions. That would include a child advocate, child and family advocate. The child and family advocate's role is to really help the family through the investigative process as well as the prosecution to keep them informed of what's happening, help them fill out um, paperwork, um, to follow up with them, make sure their children are receiving counseling. Um, what we see is you'll be familiar with child advocates or family advocates or victim advocates as they're sometimes called uh, with local law enforcement agencies, with domestic violence shelters, and their caseloads are way below 300. And so we're running a very high caseload for a combined position. Yes, sir. Anybody else? Now, it's my understanding that that uh, we, we can't make a decision tonight because this is just a work session, so we'll have to wait till the next meeting before we either approve or disapprove your funding request. I appreciate that. Thank you. Your Honor, the other thing that we're doing is uh, it's going to go in front of the Finance Committee first, and then they'll recommend what their recommendation will come to the Council. That, that again, will be next week, right? No, no. People are just now submitting what they want in ways of budget to us. So it'll be, when when will we? Uh, it possibly could be next week if we have them all turned in, but I'm not sure if we've got them all in yet. Okay. So it could be the first meeting in May. That's fine. We completely understand because we work with so many different city and county funders. Um, my first approach is try to um, beat everyone's deadline. And so chances are I send it off a uh, little time sooner than some counties and cities are expecting. So um, I completely understand with that. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Thank you. Okay. Mr. Peterson. Chief, can we, can we get Chief Broadhead just to kind of speak? Us I think he's the one that deals with with this, would that be your perception, Chief, on this? Is it, is it something that's worth continuing, pursuing? I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot, but. Sure. I, I, uh, you know, your Honor, if I can, if I can uh, just address sure. the points with that. So, so just to kind of put it in context, I'll try to be brief, but it's a little bit of a complicated issue. 
when children, particularly young children, um, are potentially victims of, of like sexual abuse, we only want them to be interviewed one time, right? So they don't have to continue to rehash the event. We also have issues at court when a, when a child has been asked the same question too many times, they, there, there's a, a potential that they can start trying to answer the question the way the interviewer, they, that they perceive the interviewer wants them to answer rather than answering honestly because you know, a, a social worker will question them, a police officer will, you know, and at some point they go, well, they keep asking me, I must, should be able to say yes, right? And so we're really concerned about that. So by having a forensic interview, who that's what they do for a living, by conducting those interviews, they ask the proper questions, they're not leading questions, they, they are trained to, um, you know, let the child tell the story. Um, and, then, and then when we get good collected interviews, that, pre that becomes very good evidence to use, and it precludes in many cases the child ever having to go to court. Uh, which would, would really be a, a hard thing for it to put a, a, a young child on the stand and have them um, you know, cross-questioned um, by a defense attorney. And so if there's a good interview, those are videotaped, um, the prosecution and the defense can watch those, and then they, we don't end up having a child in court. So I'm a big fan of, of forensic interviewing. I'm a big fan of having outside professionals who do nothing but that, essentially, um, for us to refer our cases to. Our investigators do travel to Casper, and, and they're there, so if they have additional questions that they don't feel like were answered adequately, they're there to, to slip notes to the, uh, to the interviewer to make sure that they get their questions answered, but uh, that, that allows us. It really is something that we would, if we didn't use the, the Child Advocacy Project, we would have to contract with someone to do that for us. So for, from our perspective, it's, a, it's a, an invaluable tool for us to use. Thank you. Anything else? Anybody else? Thank you very much. Of course. Thank you very much. Now we're going to jettison home. So <laughs> good luck with the rest of your meeting. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is the presentation of a 2015 year end annual report. City Administrator's report. Thank you, Your Honor. So, first off, I, I would just like to thank all the employees for the City of Riverton. Um, do a great job for us and uh, this annual report shows all the things that the city is involved in. Um, each department put together their own report and then uh, Megan compiled it all into one report and so I'd like to thank everybody that uh, put their effort into preparing this. Um, it is amazing all the things that the city's involved in. Sometimes you, you forget all the things that we do. So I'm going to briefly go over some of these. You're not going to I'm not going to go through each one in, in detail. That's why you have a copy in front of you and I encourage you to read it in detail uh, later on. But here's a picture of all of you lovely people. Um, and a little message for myself there. Um, what, a couple of projects that, that we've been working on for many years that have been accomplished in 2015, kind of 16. The first was the Wind River Job Corps. That was something that has been going on for at least 10 years, if not more. Um, and that was finally accomplished and dedicated in, uh, in the summer, of this last summer. The Honor Farm property um, has been worked on for over 10 years with trying to do a land swap, and then more recently to purchase it. That occurred today. And um, someone purchased that property, uh, a private developer, and hopes to develop that in the future. So that, that was good news. So that didn't necessarily happen in 2015, but pretty close. Um, <clears throat> and then the final one was air service. That was something that was worked on for many years, and that was finally solidified in 2016, but a lot of it was done in 2015. So we'll start with the Administrative Services Department. That's under the direction of Courtney. Um, so we have in the administrative services, we got finance, human resources, utility services, a municipal court, information technology, and facilities maintenance. In the finance division, um, you can go on our website. You'll find the, the budget is on there along with the audit report. <clears throat> so that's uh, available for the council and also any, any members of the public. Uh, we've had a clean audit for the last couple years, so that's a big kudos to our finance division. <clears throat> uh, 
And then that were the uh, key trends. One of the things I wanted to point out was capital outlay projects either completed or construction in progress significantly increased our net position by over 500,000. And that was from a lot of the projects that we completed in 2015. Human resources, uh, that's Kristen Watson. Uh, the human resource department spent nearly 115 hours on two major cleanup projects, which include liquor license files and personnel files, going through and making sure all the documentations are in all those and they're organized. <clears throat> this year, an employee assistance program was introduced to all city employees and their families in an effort to give our employees an avenue to help with everyday stresses in life. Utility services, uh, we have a combined a total of 76 years of customer service experience in the utility services. That's pretty, pretty impressive. Uh, they, they have a large volumes of calls. Everything goes through the front there that are received by City Hall. Um, one thing I wanted to point out under in interesting calls that they've received in this past year, a citizen called asking if we can tell him where his deceased father is buried. And so oftentimes you never know what people are gonna be calling about. A lot of it has nothing to do with the city, but they, th they look at us as an information center. Um, so they call us up and we're able to help them out. The utility billing clerks process 720 applications for service. The average number of utility bills generated total 4,876 in the amount of $564,241 per month. Uh, municipal Court, uh, this is Lila Thompson and Megan Miller. Um, just right at the bottom, I was going to point out the court's revenue for 2015 totaled $150,883. Dollars. Also in 2015, the court had 5,255 open cases, including 1,508 new cases. Information technology, that's Tim Hugis and Adam Weirich and Alex Engelhardt, and he's back there in their room right now. Um, obviously, the two largest projects they worked on was the first, our sound system here in the city hall, in the council chambers, and also in the court. <coughs> um, at the end of the day, we gained the system stability that we needed for so many years, digital recording, remarkable sound quality, and much more. So that was a, a great addition, and they put a lot of time and effort into that. Facilities maintenance uh, under Keith Jones. A uh, few projects they worked on this last year was refurbished public services office. Uh, they helped with the new security access control project and installed retrofitting LED lamps in both airport terminal and city hall. Uh, they also have been working on refinishing the trim here in the council chambers, if you've noticed that. The division provided 40 hours of snow removal services around city hall, the airport terminal, and uh, a lot of the bike paths and walking paths around town. Community Development Department under uh, Sandy Lures. Um, there's quite a few pictures in this one. Obviously, we had the grand opening of the Wind River Job Corps, which was a big project for the Community Development Department. Uh, that ceremony was held on October 5th, 2015. Uh, the department expended over 350 hours of inspecting on that project. Lovely picture of Sandy. Do I want me to point that out? A couple of the commercial pro uh, projects that went about, uh, we had the uh, Moss Orthodontics up on Sunset, uh, Little Caesars, uh, Dairy Queen, and a remodel in the Country Cove. In our mapping department uh, by Bob, uh, he shot two 2,144 GPS shots of manholes and sewer main lines, 309 sewer service lines, 2,585 water main lines and fire hydrants, and 255 water service lines. 
Um, down there to the right is a picture of an inspection while performing on the new Willow Creek Elementary School. This is a picture of our uh, Construction Board of Appeals, which assists the Community Development Department with issues affecting building construction in Riverton, and hears and decides appeals from orders, decisions, or determinations made by the building official. Um, and they have started the process of going through the codes for the new 2015 codes that <clears throat> should be adopted in July 1st, 2016. And so they, they have a lot of work ahead of them and they've done that in the past. Uh, Planning Commission Board of Adjustments. Uh, the Planning Commission reviewed 17 plats. They had zoning and rezoning hearings. They had three of those. Variance requests at six. Home occupation permits, 26, and daycare permits at 11. A couple more uh, projects that are listed here. Uh, Fremont County School District 25 had a couple of projects. They obviously the, <clears throat> the bus barn, uh, a remodel, and then also the Willow Creek Elementary. Uh, the, this is a, uh, Christy Peterson and the permit technician. Um, they performed over 1,500 inspections in a year. In 2015, they issued 12 residential permits for new homes as opposed to eight for eight in 2014. There were also four uh, duplexes constructed in 2015 compared to one in 2014. We issued 39 more residential construction permits than last year and we issued 53 more commercial permits in 2015 than in 2014. And they completed 12 more plan reviews than in the prior year. So if you look under this table in 2015, there was 480 permits issued compared to 427 in 2014. Code Enforcement Division, um, this just to help maintain and improve the quality of life in Riverton neighborhoods by enforcing the violations to, pure, to ensure public uh, compliance. As you can see, there's a lot of things that the code enforcement officer works on and cites people for, all the way from abandoned vehicles down to weeds and fences and hazardous waste. Uh, total violations, 480 for 2015. So in, uh, this is in, in our, uh, along with uh, code enforcement, there were 133 weed cases compared to 111 that we had in 2014. This kind of just gives a breakup of, of the time spent on, on the code enforcement. Obviously we have a lot of pictures that are taken, phone calls, letters sent, emails, um, and photos. So this is the uh, police department annual report under uh, Chief Broadhead. We had three new officers join RPD in 2015 and also one new dispatcher. A uh, couple of activities that they're involved in is shop with a cop and that, that's been in the 10th year. Also they partnered with the library to show the film Havana Curveball. Anybody ever seen that one before? Uh, there were two incidents in 2015 that shook the community. Obviously, the, 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 the child that um, was killed in the crosswalk struck by a vehicle. And then the second one was the male subject who entered the Center of Hope and, <clears throat> and shot two people, one fatally. Um, we also have a lot of groups in town that are trying to work on our alcohol problem. One, two of those are the Solutions Committee and Volunteers of America. All of these efforts have dramatic impact on the issue. Um, custodial uh, situation solely for public intoxication are in a steady decline, and we attribute that to the many people that are moving to help this problem.
calls of service. Um, we had uh, 13,056 uh, police reports uh, in 2015. Under patrol in 2015, officers issued 1,229 traffic citations, 1,610 written warnings, and officers arrested 1,822 persons in 2015 for a total of 2,539 offenses. Real quick to ask one question. Chief, over here, I'm looking at the burglaries. Do you, do you have a, just a, a reason as to why the big jump in that? that? I mean, those that appears to be the only one that really dramatically increased. Do you have, a, have any guess as to what caused a jump from like in the, in the 30s to all of a sudden over more than double? Your Honor, we, we looked at that pretty hard, and we, there was no pattern to that. We didn't have a specific, like a pattern burglar that we caught that had, you know, done a, had been individually responsible for a lot of burglaries. I, I tend to think it might be one of those statistical anomalies that, you know, maybe we had clusters in January and December that typically are spread out between years. Uh, I, I really don't have an answer for, for that. We could not find a pattern to it. I, that seemed to be the only number in, in the whole graph that all of a sudden seems to kind of blow up. Yeah, I really suspect that uh, in 2016 that number is going to return, you know, much closer to normal, and then and we'll have to take a look at it. Really, I think statistics, particularly when we're dealing with such a small data sample, uh, really we need to look at those in, you know, three, five, and ten-year increments before we even see a trend. And, and so I really don't think that there's anything happening that's going to create a trend for burglary, but we'll just have to watch it. Under use of force, uh, 2015 officers used force during 72 separate incidences. Um, this continues a significant downward trend in the use of force by R RPD. Under training, uh, in 2015, members of RPD attended 2,381 total hours of training. Under detectives, uh, this year detectives filed a total of 31 felony cases with the prosecuting attorney's office. Uh, interesting enough, we have a prescription drop-off here at City Hall. It's out in the foyer there. Um, <clears throat> we had 459 pounds of medications. That includes packaging that were destroyed. That's, that's, that's a lot of medication. <clears throat> Victim witness in 2015 served 243 new newly reported victims of crimes, as well as 23 anonymous victims seeking information. Animal control, uh, during 2015, there were 1,148 animal-related calls in Riverton. And then here's a picture of our uh, school resource officers. We have three full-time school resource officers, um, and they do, they do a lot from helping out in the schools to coaching and mentoring and serving as a liaison to the district uh, for our children. So then we go to public works. Uh, first is the airport. Um, obviously we've seen, we've talked a lot about the airport. Uh, we've, we saw 3,632 employments this year down from 7,842 in 2014. Uh, we have a great crew up there. They, use, they work both as aircraft rescue firefighters and then also as police officers, so they, they do a dual role there. <clears throat> Obviously, our, our big thing that happened in 2015 was the major reconstruction project on the runway. Assets division, uh, the fleet consists of over 250 pieces of equipment from lawnmowers to road graders. And then in the lands division, uh, they replace 50 stop signs throughout the town, replace crosswalk signs with the new green signs and put in some new crosswalks. This winter and the streets and alleys crew changed how they plow snow. By plowing to the snow to the sides, they were able to clear streets sooner. This type of plowing doesn't take as long as they were able to plow more streets in a faster amount of time and it's safer for everyone. Uh, also, the streets and alleys crew, along with parks, helped with our wreck and with the, with the skate pond. <clears throat> In ways of recycling, the amount of yard waste collected by both city pickup and drop-off was at 2,112 tons. 
there were 991 tons of recyclables diverted. Uh, in the Lands Division Parks, uh, they maintained an estimated 111 acres, including 13 parks, baseball and football fields, trail systems in their facilities. <clears throat> the Parks Department installed uh, three pieces of playground equipment at Teeter Park, which replaced 35-year-old equipment. A new handicapped accessible entrance was added to the south end of the playground at J.C. Park and four benches were placed on a five foot by eight foot concrete pad for parents to observe their children playing. <clears throat> and then we also had the addition of, of the skate park in City Park. <clears throat> Under weed and pest, uh, we started fogging earlier in 2015, started on June 16th. The mosquito season lasted longer than usual and ended um, on the 2nd of September, which was three and a half months. In that time, we went through roughly nine drums or 495 gallons of, well, I thought it was something else, but <laughs> any, anybody pronounce that? Bug spray. Bug spray. <laughs> <laughs> insecticide. Yeah, insecticide. Um, <clears throat> this is in our water treatment plant. The total for 2000, no, wastewater treatment plant, sorry. The total for 2015 was 708.56 million gallons with an average daily flow of 1.94 million gallons. That's a lot of uh, treatment. Uh, in our bi biosolids, which I always put a plug in there for biosolids. If you want your garden to grow really well, get some of those biosolids and mix it in and uh, they will grow really well. This year we sold 73.5 cubic yards of biosolids at $10 per cubic yard. <clears throat> the wa wastewater treatment plant has 173 major pieces of equipment and over 120 pieces of support equipment. Collection and distribution. <clears throat> there were uh, 29 possible sewer plugs reported Approximately 8,070 feet of sewer main jetted, cleaned because of problems, and an additional 41,880 feet as a preventative maintenance. The department also vegetated approximately 11,000 feet of sewer mains. Uh, we had 12 water breaks, <clears throat> and the meter department had 29 new construction accounts installed 54 miscellaneous meters, installed 29 frozen or damaged meters, and replaced 797 MXU batteries. And those are the, those are the devices that sit on top of your meters so they can read it through the radio waves. <clears throat> also performed 1,250 utility locates in response to Wyoming One Call. Uh, in the water treatment plant, they operate uh, the water treatment plant, the well field, which is 14 wells, three booster stations, six reservoirs, and several crucial valves within the distribution system. There was no EPA violations in 2015, and they treated approximately 754 million gallons of water compared to 729 million in 2014. Ways of capital projects that were accomplished in 2015, we had the Big Bend drain ditch, which was in, uh, tied up with, with South Federal, a pumping facilities project, uh, security around the new tank up near the Job Corps. <clears throat> uh, the city also continued upgrading the water treatment plant with the um, high service pump project. City replaced 16 defective fire hydrants around town to help improve this, the water system. 1% uh, funds, we had three neighborhood concrete projects, four resurfacing projects, and one accessibility project. <clears throat> the city's infrastructure currently remains with approximately 68.2 miles of sanitary sewer mains, 67.9 miles of water mains, and 125.6 miles of paved streets. And that's just a few pictures of some of the capital projects for 2015. The one that stands out to me is this old 
high security pump at the water treatment plant. That looks that looks pretty rough. So it definitely need to be changed out. So is there any questions about the annual report? I don't hear any. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is a preliminary budget preparation discussion. City Administrator's report. Yes, Your Honor. So if you could um, open up your, your WAM handbook, I thought we'd go for, through a few of these things to help understand the, the process. So the first one is on page six. I was gonna just highlight a few. <coughs> Uh, the state of Wyoming creates its budgets based on revenue forecasts, not on actual revenues received. And the Craig report that you've heard once in a while, which is the Consensus Revenue Estimating Group, is the official estimating body for all revenues received by the Wyoming state government. <clears throat> In January of 2016, the Craig report uh, reported that the current biennium was 32 million in the negative. And then the state would be at 438 million short of revenue in the upcoming biennium. That's the budget that we're going into. <clears throat> the Governor Meade uh, has been a strong supporter of cities and towns. He was recommending a $90 million for cities, towns, and counties for the biennium. And the legislature did three things. First, they increased the distribution from 90 million to 105. And then they changed the distribution formula, which <clears throat> was beneficial to Riverton, and we'll talk about that later. And then they also, they changed the yearly distribution from August. They used to give us a lump sum of, the, of these payments in August, and now we're gonna get it in August and January. Okay, so let's move on. To page 17. So all state shared revenues are distributed to cities, towns, and counties through formulas set by the state legislative action. <clears throat> so in this handbook, uh, we're gonna go over a few of the revenues that we receive from the state. That's cigarette tax, federal mineral royalties, severance tax, sales and use tax, gasoline tax, special fuels tax, which is diesel, <clears throat> biannual uh, direct distribution funding, parimutuel funding, and Wyoming lottery. <clears throat> so the next one on page 18 is cigarette tax. Um, this is a tax on anything, you, you buy a, a pack of cigarettes and it's 12 cents per package of 20, 20 cigarettes. <clears throat> so this is just what they are and then we'll get into the funding and how it's gonna affect Riverton. <clears throat> On 19 uh, federal mil mineral royalties, this provides that 9.375% of up to 190 million of federal mi mineral royalties, not including coal bonus funds, received by the state of Wyoming annually will be distributed to cities and towns. The distribution formula is unique First, each city or town has a population over 35 receives a base of $15,000 per year. And then it's calculated on the average daily uh, membership as you can see below here. So you can see a calculation of what the city of Laramie would get based on the mineral royalties. And it's a fairly complicated um, scenario. So then we move over to severance tax. Uh, the severance tax is uh, to cities and towns is derived by a 9.25% share of 155 million distribution funded from severance tax all, on all minerals produced in the state. And this, this, the basis of distribution is based on the population. On uh, 21, sales and use tax. In 1994, the state increased the sales and use tax to four cents and decreased the distribution to the local governments by 28%. In the 2000 legislature, they made this uh, permanent. In 2002, the legislature 
approve the increase to the common local government share to 29 percent. Starting July 1st, that was moved to 30 percent. And obviously, uh, what WAM does with the basis of estimation, they give you a lot of, particularly with sales and use tax, really based on your local area, and you really need to focus on what, uh, <clears throat> what the past has been, not necessarily based on what the whole state would use for revenues. So the current distribution is 31% to cities, towns, and is based on a two-part formula. The taxes are first returned to the county of the sales transaction, then divided among the county, its cities, and towns based on the percentage of the population. So that's how the money comes back. We get 69%, I mean, the state gets 69%, 31 comes back to the county, then they divide that up based on population. Gasoline tax is a 13 cents per gallon. Distribution of the tax is as follows, 57.5% goes to the state highway fund, 13.5 to the county, 14% to county road fund, and 15% to cities and towns. Special fuels tax, which is diesel, that's a, a 13 cent per gallon, that's on page 23, and 5% of that goes to the cities and towns. Um, on the distribution, 5% share of the tax based on the ratio that the total population of the municipality bears to the total population of all municipalities within the state. So as you can see, a lot of these formulas, I mean, there, there is, there's not a lot of rhyme or reason to them, and there's, they're fairly complicated. <clears throat> Supplemental direct distribution, that's what we talked about um, in the beginning. This is the over-the-cap mineral revenues that flow through the state general fund to this account prior to the general session. And so the legislator approved the 105 that will be um, split up in two payments, which may be an issue for us in the sense that we're used to getting that up front, and so there won't be as much cash flow um, to sustain us through the year. The other thing that we didn't get out of the state legislature is that we have no county consensus money. So that was zeroed out. What, 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 and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the money a little bit later here as we go on. So then we have paramutual commission. Riverton doesn't have that, so we don't get any money. Um, it seems like we did have that some time ago. We did have paramutual that they were doing in bombers, but they obviously don't do that anymore. So there is some revenues that come back to the cities. Um, if you have paramutual betting within your within your city, the Wyoming lottery. This is a this is a new source of revenue for the city. Uh, they finally have paid off all their debts, and now they're ready to start distributing it. Um, it says until uh, June 30th, 2022, the first six million dollars in each fiscal year of these monies shall be paid by the treasurer, as they accrue to the treasurer of the counties, cities and towns for payment in the respective general funds. The percentage of the balance will be distributed to each county and its cities and towns will be determined by computing the percentage that net sales tax collected attributable to vendors as defined in Wyoming statute. And so uh, we'll be receiving a little bit of, of revenue. It's not a lot. So, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. So what that means is that you're going to get receipts based on your sales tax. Yes. So Riverton with Walmart will vend or better than Lander without Walmart. Yeah, and you can you can really see that when we go through the actual numbers here coming up, you'll see how some get very little and some get quite a bit more. Thank you, tribes. <laughs> so the first one is the cigarette tax on page 28. And you just have to scroll down till you find Riverton. Um, we're estimated to get 72674 That's up by $3,227 from our, our, the year before. Uh, then you go to the federal mineral royalties distribution, which is on page 34. And we're estimated to get $669,044. Uh, 
last year we had uh, we got six hundred sixty six thousand nine hundred eighty two dollars so this will be up uh, about two thousand dollars then we have under the cap mineral severance tax and this is on page 36 uh, Riverton is three hundred ninety six thousand two hundred nine and last year we were, we were at 397,159, uh, which is so we're down $95. What's also interesting, I don't know if you've noticed this as you go through these tables, is the populations they use in these are all different. There is no rhyme or reason. Some of them are 10,615, some are 695, some are 10,900. And so it, it's all, you can't get a, a rhyme or reason answer for that. You're saying Riverton, excuse me, Your Honor. Yeah, go ahead. You're saying Riverton doesn't have the same population in all the calculations? They don't, Your Honor. Okay. Okay. And that reason is we don't know. Yeah, I, I think it's because you have two you have two populations that are that are set forth. You have the census that comes out every ten years, and then you've got uh, University of Wyoming that adjusts your population every year based on building permits issued and and so that goes up so apparently these are all have different numbers that they use or come off of instead of saying we're just going to use a census for all of them because I think I think the, the University of Wyoming had us at 10,900 and 17 I think is our population but if you go back to our census one I think we're at 10,617 So then you go over to the sales tax one, and this is, uh, if you look on page 39 uh, for Fremont County, um, <clears throat> and these are for fiscal year 2015. They're showing off to the right there what, what they thought we would generate was, was 2170324 dollars and then the next column over is what we generate in our 1% sales tax. That's the optional at 1.7, which that's slightly above what we actually budgeted for last year. <clears throat> if you look in the middle column, they're estimating uh, we'll be down about 20% in sales, sales tax. Okay, then you go over to um, page 45. This is uh, for fuel tax. And it's estimating Riverton will get 348539 That's up um, by $2,539 from last year. So not a lot of increases. A lot of these are just a couple thousand dollars. Same thing on diesel. If you go to page 48, a river tin at 130,830. Last year we were at 130,000, so we're up by $830. And then the direct distribution that we've talked about before is on page 52. Um, as you can see, uh, river tin last year got $876,922. We're estimated this year to get $1,182, I mean $1,182,062, which is an increase of about $305,140. And that, that is because they changed the distribution <coughs> and it favored us better. Some towns got less, some got more. So in our case, it was beneficial to us. And typically with these kind of monies, since we can't count on them every year, we've never put this to operations. They've, they've went for uh, third party requests, contract for services, or we've put it to capital. And then uh, you go to the next one, you got the paramutual, which doesn't apply to us. So if you go over to page 56, this is the wild lottery. <coughs> As you can see, they're estimating we're going to get $10,414 for the year, which is not a significant amount, but 
Every little bit helps. And that is the, is there any questions about, <clears throat> this really is a good handbook to go through. There's a lot of great information in it. I encourage you to read it and go through that. <clears throat> now, so we go back, now we've reviewed the monies from the state. How is it gonna affect our budget? So some things that we've talked about as senior staff is uh, we're gonna, we're gonna have status quo on personnel, meaning we're not gonna be trying to add any new positions. Uh, we're really lucky this year in ways of insurance costs, in ways of liability. Um, Question here, you got, Mr. Roy. We're not gonna add anybody, but if we, if we uh, stumble and fall on our recycling knife, will that cause any reduction most likely yes I mean if we have to do away with uh, recycling then we'll well if uh, I don't mean it that way we don't have to do anything but live and die but we have to abide by the solid waste management so if they choose to cease and desist on recycling that will affect us how well, it'll affect us in the sense that uh, we'll have to determine what to do with our own recycling program, and that would be, we've got personnel dedicated to that, we have equipment dedicated to that, so those things would have to be looked at or, or reduced of those, because obviously we're not going to continue to have staff go around and pick up nothing, so. Well, that would be a reduction, possibly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and we may have to do reductions in staff if, if I mean, we're just in the process now. We did revenues last week. We're gonna be doing expenditures this week. When we go through that and, and there's a big gap there, we're gonna, have to, we're gonna have to make some tough decisions, so. But I guess our goal is to kind of keep it as best we can. So back to insurance, particularly in health insurance, which is always our biggest one, this is the first year we have a 0% increase. That, I, we haven't seen that since I've been here, I think every year since I've been here, we've had 10% plus. So that is, a, that is a big bonus for us this year. Um, we have a minimal increase for our dental, but it's only $2,500 for the, all the employees for the entire city, which is very small. No workers' comp increase, minimal increases to audit services. <clears throat> so, Even, even though we will be receiving additional monies from the state, um, like I said before, we're not gonna be getting that consensus monies. That consensus monies we've typically used for capital projects. <clears throat> and that is money that flows to the county, <clears throat> and then the county group gets together for all the cities and we decide how we're gonna spend that money. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I think for contract for services, you know, we had one come in today. We may have to heavily look at those <clears throat> in ways of, of any sort of increases or maybe even little cuts here and there. Um, I. Well, the, the, the one more question. So when you said that those services, last time you came out, was the last year you gave us an 18% guidelines reduction? No, the year before. Was it, was it four? Year before. Oh, yeah. For the contract for services, yes. Correct. Yeah, that was the year before. And that's where we. And we didn't follow through with it, so. The issue that we're going to have with contract for services, in my mind, there's some on that list that if we didn't provide it, the city would have to. And so if you tried to cut some of those, then trying to provide it yourself would cost more than that. There are other things on there that are not directly related. They're great causes that provide great services for the city, but it's not necessarily a city function that has to provide that. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, so obviously, and I, I explained this earlier, with the third party requests for contract for services, these will, we're sending a letter to every one that currently receives funding from us. We're gonna ask them to submit what they're requesting, some justifications for that. That will go in front of the finance committee. They will review that and they'll make a recommendation to the council 
as to what <clears throat> should be the best funding uh, options. Uh, if, you, if you look over council goals that we set a couple months ago, uh, there's a few of them in there that require money. Obviously, it's all going to be based on budgeting and, and how we can make that happen. Uh, one of those in there is, is restoring pathways like pavement restoration and lighting. Obviously, that's going to be some cost. So um, the other one was increasing our code enforcement, uh, staffing a little bit so we could have a little bit more of that, and then supporting the splash pad. So it, when we talk about all these actions, it's, it's all going to affect the budget overall, and it's, it's going to be it's going to be tight. And so we're going to have to look at all options. Um, one thing that Courtney brought up on this uh, supporting the splash pad is that we have a community gas grant that we get. It's about $7,000. That could be something that we could earmark or put towards the splash pad. It may not be what they're expecting, like we gave to the skateboarders of like $40,000, but it would be at least something because it won't be built for another year past that, so it would be something that would be carried over. But I think those are the kind of things we're going to have to look at to make this work. Um, some of the projects that we have uh, have to fund this next fiscal year, we obviously have North Federal, which is uh, water and sewer improvements, and then the stormwater. And, and that may be where we're restricting funds in our cash balances so that we can have that for the future. We've already done that for, for some of them, but we may need to do more. Um, airport, um, we're, we're going to have some expenses there. Um, Reduction in revenues because of the incentives and the loss of TSA and or Grant Great Lakes. I mean, we're going to have some. We're going to have to make it up through the general fund that way. Also, additional monies for the MRG and Forecast Inc. In our police department, we have something that we have to address in by August, and that's a Wildlink radio system, and we're estimating that's going to be somewhere in the in the neighborhood of 250,000. We thought it was going to be 500,000, but uh, the state is willing to just give us grant for about half of it. So those are kind of the musts that we're going to have that we have out there that we've already committed to, and then there's obviously going to be other needs that come up, but we're going to have to be looking at all that uh, in this next fiscal year to see if we can even make those happen. So I guess my question to all of you is: there um, is there any questions about the budgeting process? Um, are, are there items that you'd like to see in the budget or uh, we want to make sure that the budget process is as transparent as possible. Uh, we'll also be setting up individual times for council members to come in and visit with staff and go through the budget, answer any questions on a one-on-one on -on -one basis. I know that helps out. So is, are, are there any questions or, or comments? Well, Councilman Bailey. Um, so overall, if you take all these projected numbers that you just rolled out to us, where do you think just total funding, are we up 10%, down 10%? I mean, where, where are we at? Or is it too early to tell? It's, it's too early to tell. We, we may know my, more by Friday, <laughs> um, but it, it's really hard to tell. We're, we're, like I said, we're estimating the revenues right now. And then we're working on expenditures, meeting with all the departments, and then we'll combine those and see what the gap is. And then in addition to that, um, in this process, is this where we look at sewer and water rates and that kind of stuff too? Or is that a totally separate process? Uh, Your Honor, typically we've done that in a work session with water and sewer rates. The, the problem we're facing this year, and uh, Mr. Butterfield was just telling me, is that the CPI that we have is – actually in the negative. And so unless we justify it based on capital improvement projects, which we could, um, that would be the justification for increasing rates. Which I guess that's one of my major concerns is with the future expected expenditures we're going to have with the North Federal water sewer, storm sewer system, you know, I think we need to be a little bit, you know, proactive, proactive in the situation and making sure we build up some reserves. And I think we actually have maybe been a little lax in the past, not getting a 2 or 3% increase with, you know, a cost of living kind of an increase and keeping those reserves fattened up because 
you know, those, that's a big old project coming down the road, and we're not going to have the reserves to pay for it. So, well, if it's if it's a desire of the council, that's certainly something we can bring forward and 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 bring a recommendation to the council because the way it's written in the ordinance is we're supposed to bring it. I think every year and and at least up it by the, the CPI, but in this case, it's actually a negative. So we'd be happy to do that because we're as concerned as you are about making these projects work. And, and then if I can ask one more question. Sure, go ahead. Um, with regard to staffing and wage levels, is that the discussion we're gonna have too in this process? And I'm just concerned, for example, I think there's some departments within the city that we may not be paying up to what I'd call a statewide average, and there's probably some that we're paying more, and I, I guess we need to look at those. Again, with this economy changing, you know, there's some places to look there to see if we're still competitive and fair and all of that, too. So. Uh, Your Honor, we haven't really dove into that that much because we thought this year we're not going to be able to do much in ways of personnel just because if anything we're, we're staying the same or dropping and so once you open that can of worms of sink doing research or studies on those if you don't then follow through with what you find out and i don't know if we could follow through because then we would be paying out more instead of paying less but that's yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I guess it's something that we have to look at in the big picture also. Yes. Uh, yeah. Mr. Larson. Yeah. CPI, you throwing that around, what is it? I'm trying to keep up with everything. I, what does it stand for? Yeah, C. It's on it, it's the Consumer Price Index. Okay. That's what I thought, but I want to make sure I wasn't trying to come up with my own. I had some weird definitions going on in my head, so. Councilman Lord. Uh CPI is what they give old people increases in their welfare benefits, like <laughs> Social Security. How many years are you? Uh, uh, they're not getting any. Uh, we're doing away with it. As of uh, if you're over 55, you get it. If you're 54, you don't. Anyway. Uh, how much time does the do we get on the budget committee to go over this? Will we get a special session or? Yes, we will have a work session that can be one or two days. I think we have scheduled in. Well, it's right in here. If you look at your budget calendar, so the. It's obvious I haven't. Yeah, so if you look on May third, May ninth to thirteenth, preliminary budget discussion with council members. And then the work session is scheduled for May 17th. Okay. And that's with the council. We'll also be doing one with the finance committee too. That's what I'm, Yeah. that's all I'm talking about. Oh, okay. Finance committee. Oh, I thought you were talking about the whole. No. Yeah. So, so Councilwoman Hall. unfortunately I'm not gonna be here next Tuesday. So can we push that so I can be here for it since I'm chair or how does that work? The finance committee? It's in May. May. Oh, May. Yeah. May. May. Okay. Yeah, May. So ex nay that idea. So um, my other question is, is that I, I mean, I'm, I've kind of heard, I guess it's not all 100%, but we've kind of heard that certain people are retiring. Um, and so are we gonna be replacing those positions? Are we going to just do away with them? Are we gonna outsource them? Like, what's your plan for that? I, Your Honor, I think for a lot of them, I think we're gonna be replacing them. But a lot of it's depending on looking at maybe restructuring. It may be that these certain positions need to be looked at a little bit differently. And, and not necessarily that, so, so you have a position, they leave, and the only way you can really figure out what you want to do with them is kind of leave those for a couple weeks and determine where's the best way to maneuver them into other departments. Um, but yeah, we have every intention to at least cover the, our basis of what we, what we have right now.
Thank you, sir. The chair would entertain motion to adjourn the council work session. Your Honor, I make a motion that we adjourn the council's uh, work session. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? We're adjourned.